Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, this is O-Culture, where we transmit conversations on esoteric art, science, and history at 528 hertz. I'm your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. In this episode, I'll be chatting with Jeff Wolf, the scribe at secrettransmissions.com, and just an all-around cool dude. Jeff and I are going to be talking about, well, we're going to be talking about quite a lot, actually including occult philosophy and how it's misunderstood, ritual magic practice and preparation, some road trips Jeff has made that were inspired by Peter Lavenda's Sinister Forces books, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with. And Jeff is also a pretty big horror fanatic, so you know we're making a list of his top five favorite horror films. Honestly, this is one of the more personal and introspective conversations I've had with someone for this show. Jeff and I are actually quite similar. We have virtually identical professional backgrounds, and we're using this whole new media thing to explore our interest in the occult and the paranormal. Although, to be fair, he's doing it a bit better than I am. Anyway, I quite enjoyed the conversation, and I hope you do as well. Here it is. Jeff Wolf. Hey, man, thanks for being here. Thanks a lot for having me. Uh, I really appreciate it. Hey, no problem. I've been a fan of your blog for a while now. You have a, a really sick-ass blog called Secret Transmissions. You cover a lot of different ground on it. You've got posts on esotericism, philosophy, counterculture, the paranormal. You've got first-hand accounts. You have interviews with other like-minded people. It's one of the better blogs I've come across, and I'm not saying that because you're here. I really do admire what you're doing. So let's start with where your interest in the occult and the esoteric began, and why you started blogging about it. In a roundabout way, I I was interested in weird stuff and odd stuff since a very young age. And I didn't really recognize it as, you know, the occult, quote unquote, until much later into my adulthood. That that term really wasn't something that that really resonated to me or that I didn't understand it for a long time. So I, I just understood things that were weird and cool and creative and you know, outsider, rebellious, dangerous, you know, all these kinds of things appealed to me, you know, from an elementary school when I first started watching horror films it was probably the first time anything sort of occult was presented to me, or, or it certainly primed me for being interested in the occult later. So supernatural horror and science fiction films, fantasy films really sort of got me started imaginatively about, you know, things in the world that were atypical or anormal or outside of, you know, the material understanding of the world. And from there, just like a lot of kids, you know, I was interested in comic books and a lot of stuff that you don't necessarily understand as a cult is, is, is very occult. Like, and, and it kind of blows my mind, you know, and reading, for instance, you know, Our Gods Wear Spandex by Christopher Knowles, you know, is a book that really shows you how deeply embedded the occult is not just in even in comic book form, but in all of our pop culture media. So it, it's always been there in in these various forms. Indirectly, I've been interested in in the esoteric things, hidden dark things. You know, I loved going into alternative types of bookstores. You know, when I didn't even really necessarily understand what these books were or what what it was even about, it was the feeling that I got sort of in going into an occult bookstore, for instance, like the one I grew up around, you know, I would go in there and buy these weird candles and incense and stuff as a teenager. And I didn't really understand the books at all, but I just thought it was a really cool place because it had, you know, wall to wall, all kinds of what I've come to find out is just full on occult library book. And I, I later as an adult, I go back and I said, whoa, holy shit, you know? I mean, I had no idea what I was sort of getting into at that time. But, you know, coming back to it later, you know, uh, I was amazed at how close I got to it and, and but didn't necessarily grasp on to what it all meant until much later on. So, you know, from there, uh, again, I just was into punk rock, heavy metal, all these kinds of weird films, underground films. And, you know, in the 90s, the X-Files was going. So I was a huge X-Files fan as a kid. And, you know, obviously that, well, not necessarily a cult of the paranormal and, and extraterrestrial UFO stuff was, was totally fascinating to me. 
and you know, I was totally into all that. I was really into the to the films of David Lynch and not really knowing it, you know, not really understanding what it all meant, but just, you know, how esoteric and, and odd and strange and from a spiritual sense even that you know, the works of David Lynch were. And the fact that I was into it at, you know, at fourteen years old, I think sort of says that I was sort of always primed for it, but you know, I didn't really break into it hardcore until you know, later into my late twenties, even. You were watching David Lynch films at fourteen. Yeah, I was. I mean, I was into really obscure films from a very early age. I would go to the VHS store growing up, you know, and I would ride my bike up there, and I'd rent all these crazy movies, you know. And I said, you know, horror really got me started. But then from there, I ventured out into lots of other stuff, B films and indie films, you know. And so eventually, you know, Lynch's stuff came up, and. Yeah, I just loved it, you know, eraser head. I think at 15, I had an eraser head t-shirt, you know, it's just, wow. again, looking back, I'm like, wow, that was pretty rad. But I wanted to be a director at a young age. So I'd rent all these movies and I would tape them all on my VHSs. So I would do VHS to VHS copies, you know, and I, I would put three, three movies per VHS tape. And then I would have this little card catalog index box where I would write down the name of the film, the year, the director possibly the screenwriter and then the actors. And I had this little weird catalog. It was just one of these obsessive things that I did as a kid. I mean, I get it now about myself, but it was pretty odd. And I think my mom thought it was pretty, pretty strange as well. So, I mean, the counterculture was just something that always appealed to me, whether it was in the form of art or books or films. Uh, the, the spiritual aspect of occultism and esotericism didn't, didn't come to me till, till much later on, but Certainly, like the visual symbolism, the creative presentation of the occult was something that got me right away. Secret Transmissions really started as a project in a printed form before I ever decided to transition it over into an online blog version. And uh, I've been doing the, the online blog now for pretty much exactly a year now, coming up on the anniversary for it. Prior to that, my whole drive behind it was to do something non-computer based. So it's fairly ironic or telling about the times, but um, my, my initial drive for this thing was to get back into working with my hands and doing something handmade because I've been you know, reading so many different blogs and listening to so many different people's podcasts and everything and just was, you know, being super stimulated and inspired by all that. But I just thought, you know, man, what could I do? You know, like how can I sort of enter into this field of paranormal and the occult in my own way or have my own voice about it and also satisfy another need that I had which is you know, doing something artistically or creatively that didn't require you know working in the Adobe suite platform and being sort of non Photoshop based so I decided to do a zine at the very beginning and uh, you know I've done them I've done a number of them and I We'll probably still continue to do the zines, but at some point I realized, man, you know, it just as awesome as, as doing a zine was, I just couldn't quite contain everything that I wanted to contain in that format, and it was just too irregular. I wanted to also have an outlet that could be more immediate because it's it's quite time consuming to do a to do a handmade zine. But uh, I'm do I am glad I, I started that way because it really set up you know my style or my approach of of that aesthetic, you know, that old school collage based punk rock, black and white zine, which I really just, I tried to carry over to the extent that I can into the, to the digital version of it. But I think starting at, at, at a print zine really helped me kind of ground myself in, in the voice and the aesthetic. And, and really, you know, the voice of it is really subversive, you know, and it's, it's not meant to be overly serious. I don't present myself as an intellectual expert on any of these topics that I like to cover. So I, my whole intent is sort of to inject a little bit of my own absurd perspective or point of view or sense of humor into it. And I think in that sense, I've been really in, inspired by Robert Anton Wilson and his work and, uh, you know, his whole approach to conspiracy, the paranormal, the occult, and the levity that he brought to his work I think is really sort of my touch point because I'm, I'm not an academic, I'm not a scholar, so I'm not able to do the sort of work, the in-depth sort of work that somebody like 
Peter Labenda or Gordon White or somebody of that stature can do. So I wanted it to be something meaningful and, and, and have a vehicle to introduce serious ideas, things that are really meaningful to me, but to do it in a way that's more creative than it is academic, if you understand what I mean. So I started writing some short stories, and again, in a very absurd sort of uh, pulp, pulp fiction style, science fiction, fantasy stuff. I figured, you know, it'd be really cool for me to just have, have a zine and like kind of, you know, do some short story writing and, and I can inject like paranormal or conspiratorial ideas into the short stories, you know, um, whether it's like stuff like the secret space program or mind control or uh, extraterrestrial stuff. Um, I've, you know, kind of like played with all those ideas in the short stories. And then also like having pages that were just dedicated to a certain piece of history, paranormal history, you know, whether it's like the process church cult or the Necronomicon or like MK ultra experiments. I would just uh, make all these collages based on any one of those ideas, you know, and sometimes I put like links or, Twitter handles are things where like if people were to pick up this magazine and like have no idea like what any of this crazy shit was, you know, like maybe they'd be intrigued and like go on to another website that would direct them to further, you know, study these, these, uh, underground ideas. And it was like kind of really my whole point was just like, I like this stuff. I'm not an expert in any of it, but I have a creative perspective on it and I would love to sort of help spread the ideas or sort of infect the populace with this countercultural thoughts. So that's really been my approach is sort of like, Hey, I'm a fan. I can kind of have a point of view on it, but I'm not an expert. And I'm just sort of trying to gather other interested people and sort of go on this crazy ride into the occult and the paranormal with me. But um, I also realized like, Hey, I want to talk to some other people. You know, I want to interview people. So, and, and going into a blog format really has allowed me to, to feature other people's work and reach out and make connections with other people like filmmakers and authors and people who have an occult practice, uh, people who are into anarchism or have political ideas that are completely outside of the norm and, you know, really take it a step further as far as projecting different ideas out into the culture by uh, having interviews. So, you know, the blog really, it still has, it has visual representation of the zines. It has my short stories. It has, you know, poetry that I've written and weird drawings. And it can contain all those like personal projects that are meaningful to me, but it also can serve as a, as a platform for other people's work. That's been, you know, part of the, the mental shift that I've experienced in my life. They, they're people who have uh, sort of redirected my entire way of thinking about things, whether it's like politically or spiritually or creatively. And, and help uh, get those ideas out to people, hopefully. And hopefully people who are maybe interested in one facet will uh, kind of come into the site through that and then maybe look around and like get exposed to other ideas or other perspectives that, that they didn't necessarily know about. So that's kind of really what, what the, the hope is with the blog. And, um, you know, I, I'm doing the best I can with it as like a sort of passion project. I, I hope that it continues to grow and expand into... To other areas as long as it keeps me stimulated like and not wanting to blow my brains out working a corporate job i'm pretty happy about it so <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay what was it specifically about occult themes that stood out to you you know like whether it was through film or any other form of art i think you know there's just that taboo shock of it you know um i think probably some of the first stuff that i picked up was the cliche obvious stuff you know like the necronomicon so again going back to horror films and watching uh films like reanimator and from beyond that were written by hp lovecraft and turned to film and watching the evil dead films somehow or another i got this idea about the, the necronomicon and, uh like a lot of people picked up the simon edition of the necronomicon probably never even really read it as a kid but i got it and i thought wow this is weird you know this is I think the art and the, the sigils in there, they just look very horror. You know, they look very dangerous mm -hmm. and dark, you know, and I was certainly into the dark side and, and things that appeared 
either like, you know, have a heavy metal sort of edge or a punk rock edge. So I think just the visual aesthetic really just kind of um, lined up with a lot of the this sort of subculture underground stuff that I was into. Isn't Peter Lavenda linked to that Simon Necronomicon? Yes, he he's most certainly is. And uh, I mean, everybody that I know that I trust and am into is pretty much convinced that uh, either he wrote all of it or he wrote a great portion of it. Um, and, you know, Peter's, for whatever reason, has decided to be sort of coy about the whole thing, admitting that he was there, he was involved. He says he was just a consultant, but I think seeing the sort of writer that he's become in his other works, it's, I don't know, I, I think he has the knowledge and he was in that scene at that time and he has that sort of, if, if somebody was around that could understand the reference points that he pulled together from H.P. Lovecraft to the ancient Middle Eastern cultures that, that he pulled from, yeah, it seems pretty likely that it was, was Peter. Well, he just published a, a novel about Lovecraft, and he's written extensively about the Yazidi, which is that Middle Eastern folklore, I think. So it makes sense that he would be involved yeah, in that. I, yeah, it seems like all the all the tangents are there. So I would consider it his publication. And I even, you know, I did something interesting in one of my zines where uh, I did a spread on the Necronomicon, a collage spread. And I even just included in there... Um, you know, one of the legal documents that, that has Peter Lavenda's name on it as far as the owner of the title, the Necronomicon. So I just put it in there and along with some other cool like sigils and stuff in this collage just to at least say, hey, there's there's the document right there. Yeah, You make of it what you will. But. Speaking of Lavenda, while he is a topic of conversation right now, it's probably a good segue into an article or a series of articles, I guess, that you wrote for your, your blog about a Sinister Forces-inspired road trip that you took. Could you maybe tell the listeners about that? Yeah. Luckily, uh, I happened to live in a place that turned out to be very close to a lot of the locations that, that Lavenda wrote about in Sinister Forces, the first edition. These Indian burial grounds uh, that he writes about and... Uh, some other places and I just decided, Hey, what the hell, you know, I, I like going on road trips with my family and I love to go to see places that are interesting possibly and have a paranormal sort of connection. And so I just kind of planned a road trip around, you know, as many of these locations that Lavenda talked about as possible. So, so starting oh, in the Detroit area, driving down South into down into Ohio is where a lot of those Indian burial grounds are. Uh, we were able to, Knock off, I think, two or three sites in Ohio, and then headed up, headed towards West Virginia, where I was able to hit one more, and pretty much just wanted to do a blog on it, take a lot of photos of the sites, sort of see what I'd read about with my own eyes, and write some firsthand sort of documentary impressions of what occurred, and you know, along with I ended up going to a bunch of other, you know, odd and weird places on this particular road trip. But really, you know, the, the spark of it was, was these places that I found out about through Lavenda. And, uh, yeah, I mean, it turned out really cool. The places that you're talking about are in Chillicothe, in that general area, I suppose. And we're talking about the Serpent Mound and the Mountain City. I've been to both, uh, but not for probably at least a decade or more, which is kind of sad because they're only about three hours from where I live. But what did you make of the sites while you were there? What sort of physical impression did you get? Uh, what sort of energetic impression did you get? Well, I mean, visually, they're beautiful places. So it's just kind of, you know, you're just sort of astounded at, at what, whichever culture you attribute the build to, what they were able to accomplish. And the, the really interesting astronomical alignments that are very obviously and clearly marked there. The they really interesting fact that it's built right on the edge of uh, where a meteor had impacted sometime way back. So th there's a lot of really interesting, you know, factoids and interesting speculations. And it's still a very mysterious location in and of itself, not completely, you know, settled as to what, what it all meant or what the purpose of it all was. You know, so energetically, I can't say that I felt any bizarre sort of uh, physical sensation or phenomena. But I just I was overwhelmed with 
with the beauty of it and he was just it was exciting to to be there and I just kind of geeked out at you know at all the possibilities that surround it you know they do a really nice job with with providing information there and the and you know you you're able to get an aerial view of the serpent mound by climbing up this big platform you're able to get a fairly good overview of the entire winding serpent and it's just a really cool thing to see. I had I had my family with me, so I had two kids that are that are running around and going crazy, you know, all the while while I'm trying to I'm trying to like kind of take it all in and and get all these cool photographs and and feel something. But at the same time, uh, you've got these kids to wrangle in, and so I didn't get to sit there for a really long time. I did get a few cool moments, you know, where I. I wanted to capture whatever was there, if there was anything as far as an energetic impression. You know, I wanted to, I sat there by a part of the mound for a good clip and just sort of meditated and, you know, hope to catch, catch any sort of resonance that might have occurred. But um, it was the middle of the day and there was other people there. So I didn't see any UFOs or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you make of the sites in terms of theoretically there's a lot of legends surrounding different cultures that may have built them. What do you think of it after being there? I think it's, it's definitely a purposeful site. I mean, I think it was a ceremonial site from all I can tell. And, you know, certainly laid out in a fashion that had astronomical significance and there's connection to, you know, the Draco system and the constellation Draco. So anytime you see that situation where, where you've got, a site or a mound or a monument that's that's built with astronomical alignments you know it's it's clear that it's it's got ceremonial purpose and the serpent has all sorts of different connotations or symbolic potential meanings so I, I definitely think it was it was there purposefully to possibly capture energy or at least to symbolically represent something significant to that culture that built it and so it's certainly got meaning, and they've put a lot of effort into creating it. So there's obviously like a lot of weird speculations about things that really can't be proven, you know, but like stuff that I think Ross Hamilton has put out out, out there. Yeah, you know, it's interesting to think about, but I, I really can't say that I know for certain about any of those claims, whether any of that stuff is true at all. Uh, I just kind of wanted to take it for what it was, see it for myself. I, I do like to research and read up about the speculations, but I, I personally can't say that I've come to any conclusions about it. Ross Hamilton positioned that, uh, you know, 5,000 years ago, there was a race of giants that were responsible for building them out, you know? Yeah. And that there are some eight foot tall skeletons that were found. You know, another, another thought about it is that the effigy, effigy was um, constructed to send a message to the sky gods to say, hey, we're here, or whatever, that there is potentially some extraterrestrial significance to, or, or some symbolic message that, that it represents. You know, it's just hard to say. I mean, how do you know? It's all pretty much speculation. Yeah, we don't have a definitive answer one way or the other. But there's also an, an interesting correlation here that there is a, a correctional institution near the site Oh, yeah. Was I, that a Peter Lavenda thing, or was that something that you mentioned? Yes, I, I mentioned it as well, just for just in case for anybody who, who is, had read my blog that didn't read Peter's books. Uh, but Peter certainly, uh, he did all the work, work and, and background on the Manson connections, because, I mean, Manson plays a huge role in the Sinister Forces trilogy. And, you know, and his time spent at the Chillicothe prison, is a, it's a prison that's directly next to the burial site. We went and drove up to the prison site, which was kind of trippy because, you know, I, I kind of pulled up and I wanted to get a photo of the prison, but then, you know, I start to see this, this vehicle start to kind of really get close to us and obviously was immediately like looking for what we were up to. So I, you know, got the hell out of there pretty quickly. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, it's, it's a super ominous, huge industrial prison and just next door is this sacred ceremonial burial mound. Yeah, I mean, Peter's just, uh, I, he also doesn't really tell you that anything's black and white or here's proof of this or that. He just points out 
interesting synchronicities and correlations, you know, and, and they are there, you know. I'm wondering if there might be an underground connection there with the prison. Maybe there's an underground network from there that explores that area underneath the Serpent Mound. Is that a possibility? Well, just to clarify, um, the prison, the Chillicothe prison, is actually located next to Mound City. So that was the second stop that we made on the road trip was because Serpent Mound's pretty kind of isolated and it's got its own there's pretty much an, a network of uh, different burial mounds all throughout this area of Ohio uh, but they are sort of separated by some distance and to get to where the prison was 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 near Mound City where the Hopewell culture Mound City was 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 located so but again you know as far as the underground stuff, it's your guess is as good as mine. But Mount, Mount City is really cool. It's super impressive because it's a series of different mounds. They're all different shapes. And, you know, there's just a plethora of them in this, this big open field. And there I really got to spend more time with, with the mounds and just sort of hanging out in the vicinity and getting very close and just, you know, you just sort of think about, what might have happened or try to take yourself back to that time period or think about the, the significant items also that were, you know, the charged symbolic items that were part of the, part of the land. And just, it's clear, you know, there's spiritual intention behind all that and energy. And these people clearly believed in, in the earth, the energy of the earth and the, you know, spirits and passing on to them, to the other worlds. So I, I just think that, whether it's just psychological or it's emotional or whatever, there's definitely a feeling that you get when you're in a, in a place like that where there's been such a long history of, of reverence and ritual that's been carried out. And the fact that, the, you know, people decide to build these prisons in the vicinity is uh, it's just a very odd, it's just a very bizarre thing. And, and just where these prisons are too, like this, it's not isolated in, in sort of a, on the countryside. I mean, it's right in the middle of uh, a main area of shopping and living and everything, you know? Yeah. It's, it's... just this big ass prison. It's, it's just right in the middle of a community, not to mention, you know, a significant travel destination or historical site. It's just very, the juxtaposition was very odd. And then it was, you know, even more odd really when we got down to Grave Creek Mound which Grave Creek Mound, out of everything that we saw, was the most weird, the most eerie, the most bizarre. That is directly across from a really old, supposedly haunted prison, which was, you know, no longer functioning. But uh, but the history and the stuff that goes on in that that particular prison, it was it was very much more unsettling. You know, the the presence and the ambiance of that prison at Grave Creek Mound, again right in the middle of a neighborhood, just smack dab in the middle of a neighborhood. You've got this burial mound, but then you've got this old, crazy-looking, very intimidating, gothic-looking prison, which, you know, they they use that facility to do riot training, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for one thing, and it's weird. And then the other thing is that people go and do tours as a haunted site. You know, they do those haunted tours at that prison. So, uh, in addition to, you know, probably a lot of other really nasty and crazy stuff that, that goes on at prisons or deaths, people who have died in this prison, it was a definite heavy, weird energy at that place. And um, my wife was super freaked out. She wanted us to get the hell out of there as soon as possible. I was like kind of vibing on the whole energy of it and wanted to get as many photos as I could get, but it... it uh, she was just more or less panicking and, you know, our daughter at the time was young and she started crying and she had a falling accident right outside of this mound where we had a big panic there and almost thought we had to go to the hospital because she tumbled on this street and, you know, her forehead exploded with this big, I don't know, <laughs> it was, uh, it kind of came like out, out like a golf ball. Wow. And so, she, you know, she's screaming, you got my baby screaming, my wife's freaked out and weirded out. I'm looking at uh, this freaking big-ass, dark, ominous prison, and <laughs> we had other people 
some of the town people that live there were kind of meandering around and they looked really sort of uh, scraggly or just, they looked strung out to be honest with you. So you had a lot of, a lot of weird shit at the Grave Creek Mound. It sounds like it, man. And that reinforces the notion that there's probably some sinister forces at work there or just some weird energetic coincidences. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, and just the mystery there where you've got the runic stone, that's another anomaly that they can't figure out exactly where that came from or what year it's dated to and what the implications of that are, you know, it just sort of adds another layer of, of mystery, you know, and I think whether it's sinister or nefarious or anything like that, to me, I'm drawn to the mysterious and I certainly felt an air of mystery going into seeing specifically that Grave Creek Mound you know, venturing into the unknown, you know, and I mean, really, that's sort of what I try to do with the blog um, is to document as much of that as I can come across and as many firsthand experiences as I can generate. I, I like to, you know, use the blog as an outlet for that sort of thing, almost like a little, to me, that was like a, it was a road trip diary that I got to write. It's just all about exploring the mysterious and the unknown. Speaking of mysterious and unknown, you mentioned also stones and rituals a few minutes ago before that i wanted to ask you about the georgia guidestones you're the first person that i've talked to that i know of that's actually been there and that's one of those conspiracies that i refer to personally as entry level it's right there with like nazi occult stuff just one of those stories you stumble on when you first venture down this sort of rabbit hole i guess so having been to the georgia guidestones what do you make of that site? I, I certainly had read up and been told a lot of things about the Guidestones, and I was, my interest and curiosity were highly piqued by what you know all the impl- implications and all the uh, suspicions surrounding that place. So I jumped at the opportunity while happening to be in Atlanta for a conference. You know, just decided on the last day. You know, like what the hell, you know, it's just like an hour drive to get out to this place. Why not go and check it out? And it was like the 4th of July weekend, I think. And, uh, you know, it's about 70 miles outside of Atlanta. You know, we get there and it's like, it's really the, the thing about that that was weird is that it's completely out in the middle of nowhere, just out in this farm country, very remote location. And, you know, again, it's very close to like a neighborhood. I mean, there's, there's like somebody's house that's pretty close proximity to these guidestones. So, just that sort of juxtaposition was like odd. But, um, you know, with everything that I heard about it, when I got there and when I thought about it and, and when I've come to think about it even further on reflection is it's one of those things that's tantalizing. And it's, I think a lot of people would like to jump to the most darkest, most nefarious conclusion. You know, there's just something about that in our imaginations and our psyches and people who are drawn to the dark side or it, it certainly lends itself to some dark thoughts. And I think whenever there's unanswered questions and there's mystery and, you know, there's statements like keeping the world population under, you know, what is it? 500,000 or what? The first step is to maintain humanity at 500 million. 500 million. And, you know, when you have you know, yeah, I mean, 8 billion people on the planet right now, that doesn't look very uh, encouraging. But then when you read the rest of the guide, it doesn't sound nefarious. It's actually pretty positive. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's, I think that that there's a strong possibility that that uh, the Rosicrucian philosophy had an influence on these individuals that to decide to erect these guide stones. Um, I certainly lend some credence to that theory. Um, again, to me, knowing what I know about the occult and esotericism, I'm not the least bit threatened by the Rosicrucians. I actually think they uh, are super cool, you know, and have a very inspiring and interesting take on the world and spiritual system of belief. But when you have people that are, you know, rabidly dogmatic about a particular religion, anything that's not that religion is automatically seen as some sort of satanic conspiracy. Some of the people that I encountered when I went to visit the place, I think were certainly on that side of, um, this is a bad thing, you know, (laughs) this is, and I don't even know why, you know, why they come to see it then, you know what I mean? If they think it's the symbol of death and, and the new world order, 
but they do. And, you know, the thing that really bums me out is that the, some people have taken it further to go ahead and vandalize and sort of try to create drama around this thing with, you know, they talk about, oh, there's blood and there's blood on the stones. and Yeah, there is blood on, these, not not all of them, right? Just one, like where it's, and it's from the top down, I think, right? Like it's on top of it. Like how would somebody have gotten blood up there? I, I mean, to me, these are just stunts. I mean, I, I am just, I, I'm an occultist, you know, I am interested in in alternative esoteric spirituality. So for, for somebody who's dogmatically fundamentalist, like I said, anything that's not fundamentalistly true is, is going to be satanic and therefore lend itself to uh, human sacrifice and child abuse and all this other, to me, horseshit, fear-mongering. And so I've come to see that the Guidestones more is more in that light. You know, I, I don't know if the people that made them were, were great guys or if they were innocent, peaceful, spiritual Rosicrucians or, um, or anything else. I don't know who they were. Nobody knows who they were. But I don't jump to the conclusion that this is a satanic monument of the New World Order and they're plotting to kill us all. I just, you know, that's the last assumption that I'm going to make if I'm going to make any assumptions you know, based on the things that I do and the people I associate with who are smeared by the same conspiracies. Well, the stones are attributed, going back to your comment about the Rosicrucians, to R.C. Christian, R.C. Rosicrucian, Rosie Cross. I mean, I think that's a pretty obvious connection to make. Do we know who personally paid for them and, and put them in there? You know, what group was actually behind it? No, but... Just that name alone would lead you to believe that it, it may have been connected to the Rosicrucians. I've also heard Ted Turner was involved. I think he's a Freemason or part of some of these other groups like that. He's obviously very wealthy. Not so influential anymore as he used to be in like the, the 80s and 90s. But, I mean, at least you don't hear too much about him. And it is outside Atlanta, which is where he lived and made his fortune. So that connection always intrigued me, too. Yeah, I mean, the R.C. Christian bit, you know, certainly seems like a symbolic illusion and you know it's 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 something i covered in my in the blog that i wrote it's certainly a strong possibility certainly you know interesting i mean they were utopians and were trying to influence society in a, in a good way you know it's possible that the threat of some sort of nuclear holocaust had something to do with with some of the claims that they made who knows it's it's a very interesting place i love the mystery about it it's a beautiful piece of construction. I think that the, again, the astronomical stuff that was built into the design is very fascinating and interesting. The alignments there certainly indicate some sort of a belief or some sort of a, a cosmic correlation going on there. To me, I'm just, you know, the most interested about why they wanted the secrecy or if they knew that they were going to be this provocative by keeping this many secrets about it. You know, I mean, I just, those are the things that I wonder about. And I think that they had something buried, like a time capsule that was buried there that, that may have some further information. There's something there that says that it was six feet below the monument is this time capsule thing. Who knows what that's about? Um, I'm certainly curious about that. It might just be this thing that we never, we never have the answer for. Well, if there is a time capsule buried there, why has nobody dug it up yet? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. I, I can't tell you who owns the land. If it's the city, the state owns the land or private property or that you, you would have to get something clear to move the stones and dig underneath them. You know, I'm not really too sure about about that aspect of it. But I certainly would love to know what's in it if there is something down yeah, there. Me too. And I would just assume that that site's been heavily vandalized for the last 15 or 20 years. I would just think that at some point, if the rumor of a time capsule of some sort is, is in there, like why wouldn't they have tried to dig it up? I mean, these are these things are pretty big and heavy, and you would definitely need a lot of uh, construction tools, some heavy-duty machinery to... Right to knock them down or get them out of the way. So, I mean, that's one thing. For me, I'm, I'm happy to let it, to allow it to be a mysterious thing. You know, I love that there's these mysterious sites in America, around the world, that uh, that pique our imagination or cause us to wonder or that they're, that you know have spiritual, symbolic significance and that there's there's an energy there because of that. The other shit, the, you know, the New World Order and the, 
the fear mongerings, fundamentalist religious paranoia, I mean that really ruins it in a lot of in a lot of ways to me. And you know, that's why I called my article In Search of the Georgia Illuminati, you know, as a as a very much a tongue in cheek sort of comment about it because everything is the Illuminati, you know. And yeah, I I can tell you that when I first sort of was getting into conspiracy and other things like that, I was intrigued by that possibility and, and that the secret societies were all dark and nefarious and, and that the Illuminati was this evil thing and this evil cabal. And sure, I was intrigued by that, but if you do a little more research and, and you start to take certain things into consideration and you start to look at the sources about who's propagating the, the, the evil conspiracies and then Pretty much every every time it comes to fundamentalist dogmatic Christians, you know, not, nothing against Christians or Christianity, but the fundamentalist dogmatic apocalyptic Christians tend to be the source of a lot of these New World Order Illuminati conspiracies. And I'm not saying here, as people are getting really pissed off listening to this, that there are no evil secret societies out there. there there's not people out there plotting to do evil things. I... I I just find that, that it's displaced oftentimes. It's displaced onto spiritual organizations or fraternities of people who are just genuinely trying to tap into the mysteries of this world to better themselves, to better their communities. And they're the ones getting the brunt of all this, you know, just because because of the unknown, just because kind of laziness, really. It's it's just lazy to me intellectually to to say, oh, well, the skull and bones is no different than the Bilderberg is no different than the trilateral commission then no different than the Freemasons or the Rosicrucians or the, the golden dawn or any of these other occult spiritual based groups, uh, you know, lumping them all together like that and saying that it's all quote unquote an Illuminati. It's just ignorant. It's historically factually incorrect. And it just shows you somebody who's not really, looking at real information or getting to understand the difference between these groups, the purposes that they have, and, and why the secrecy to begin with. Do you think the fundamentalist Christians are simply, by propagating this, just trying to fulfill a prophecy? Well, I mean, you could certainly easily come to that conclusion. I mean, because when you are you think that things are predestined and predetermined, and that certain things have to go along to a certain story, then yeah, I mean, you're always going to be on the lookout and not, if not intentionally trying to create these situations, which there's certain politicians out there that do seem to think that they could use their power to turn things fucking insane or <laughs> destroy us environmentally or just allow certain things to happen because, oh, well, it's fine. You know, we're, we'll all be safe, right? We, we want this apocalypse to happen anyway. So, well, but hold on with, a minute there. I do think that while there is probably some aspect of fate or destiny at play here, that free will has a lot to do with it too. And this group may think that something is destined to happen, but as far as their free will is concerned, they're going to do what they can to work toward it anyways. Yeah, I, I certainly think that's a possibility. And, and if you get into looking at certain extreme cults or sects, of apocalyptic Armageddon based Christianity. Yeah, I mean, that's probably something that's that they would actively try to pursue to bring about, to bring to culmination. I can't say I haven't been involved in any of them. So I don't I don't want to kind of reverse smear anybody else, you know, with, with some sort of second hand information. But this certain things I've read seem to seem to indicate that um at least some sects or occults where they're really interested in the Armageddon, uh, wouldn't be opposed to ushering on, you know, the eschaton. You know, and fundamentalist anything is is a dangerous path to walk on. But I've also heard people call occult philosophy and occult practice dangerous. I've heard people say it's an elite belief system, and following that path leads you into the clutches of the Antichrist or you know, something <laughs> something similar. But you say something completely different. You actually wrote in a blog recently that you're into the occult because, quote, I want to attempt to discover and be a better version of myself, end quote. Now, that doesn't sound dangerous at all to me. But why do you think the occult has this dark and evil reputation? Is it just misunderstood? Or is it so powerful that 
in order to deter people from using it for the betterment of themselves or of society, that it has to be demonized or intentionally masked as dangerous to keep people away from it? Well, I think it's possible that it's a little bit of both of those things. I think predominantly there's just a lot of ignorance surrounding the occult and uh, a lot of jumping to conclusions and a lot of fear-mongering, not dissimilar to the Red Scare you know, or the Salem Witch Trials. Um, this just fervor that gets built up around things that people don't understand or they're fear, fear, afraid of. Um, so then a lot of legends, urban legends, start to get built up around certain ideas or groups. And I, I think you can always find a few really messed up things that have happened. You know, there's certain groups that have had unfortunate incidences happen in the name of, quote unquote, the occult, and therefore would validate or prove to somebody who is against it that, yes, all these things are horrible. You know, like I think it was like the P2 Lodge in Italy, you know, it was a Freemasonic group that was involved in underworld activities, organized crime activities, murders. But I would say that by and large, that that's an aberration, you know, or that that's, that's something anomalous considering all of history and all, all the activity that goes around these groups. You can find any group and, and eventually find somebody who's doing something illegal, you know, and I mean, just obviously look at the church. I mean, come on. So what, what you can't do is pull out isolated incidents of somebody who happened to be a member of something and say, see, look, they did this horrible thing. That means all this, all these people are horrible. You know, it's just, a, it's a silly way to reason. So I think you, you have that going on. You have an unfortunate sort of situation where, again, people don't make any distinctions between say, the Church of Satan, or witchcraft, or Freemasonry, or the Golden Dawn, or Rosicrucianism. I mean, there's just so many different flavors and shades and pathways within the occult that it's, that it's to draw any completely broad or sweeping generalization about it. It's just, you know, you're not going to really point to anything very truthful. Just the, just the same as I wouldn't, with a broad stroke, say, all of Christianity is this, you know, or all of Islam is that. Never would I say that because I have identified cults or extreme sects within those faiths and, and said that those things are problematic. I don't at all intend to mean that all people of faith of organized religion are ignorant in some way or are, you know, incorrect in their path. I, I don't want to fall victim to the, the thing that I perceive happens in reverse towards the occult from the organized religions. So, I think by and large, people who are interested in the occult are interested in spiritual development, spiritual growth, unlocking the mysteries of the universe, the cosmos, tapping into secrets. You know, again, just because it's secret or hidden doesn't mean it's evil or that it, that it has any nefarious ends to it. But for some people, they just can't deal with the idea of secrecy or that the fact that certain pieces of information are protected, you know, or made difficult in order for the path to, to find it to be meaningful. The path is rigorous, you know, whether it's, you know, true illumination or true transcendence of a, any sort of a spiritual attainment. That's a rigorous path, no matter what direction you're taking. So even someone like me or anybody else, just picking up the Quran or the Torah or the Bible and thinking that I can just read it and understand it without deep and very rigorous study it would be very, very foolish. You know, there's a lot of symbolism even within organized religion. There's a lot of meaning that's encoded things and, and cross-referenced ideas that would, you know, take people a lifetime of study to to get their true fruits of it. So occultism is, is, is no different. And I think in another sense, I mean, if you read stuff like that I would recommend, like from Manly P. Hall, they will talk about things in a way where the true spiritual enlightenment is something that is, are not dangerous, but overwhelming psychologically or, or mentally that to touch the spark of the divine would, is, is a very energetically and psychologically overpowering situation. And that that shouldn't just be sort of treated cheaply so that anybody could just kind of walk into it, walk into that sort of heightened experience. I think that they made the path a certain, with a certain amount of rigorous symbolism to get through so that in order that you know only a true sort of honest seeker 
would get those fruits because they're supposed to be divine. They're supposed to be extremely special. And so they guarded those those things so that the, the profane wouldn't be able to just very happenstancely sort of get their way towards that. So that you know, there's there's reasons for secrecy. Well, and to your point, you were talking a few minutes ago about, you know, what's actually hidden. The things that are hidden from us are usually the more positive, uplifting, enlightening things. You know, I mean, you could just go with something as basic as news or health. And when you look out and you see, well, what kind of news is being portrayed? Well, it's all negative. It's all fear mongering. What kind of access do we have to things that could better our health? Well, the things that are actually good for us are against the law. It's very hard to get them. Right. You know, so yeah. these sorts of solutions, whether they're physical or spiritual, that are tucked away aren't usually negative. They're actually good for us. Most of them are. So I also don't really like the way that we use the word occult these days because it does carry a sort of negative connotation with it. It does have that reputation as a word for meaning something that's dark and mysterious and, and evil, but it's just literally something that's hidden away, you know, like marijuana curing cancer is an occult piece of information. I mean, it's not so much anymore. Well, like it's... you were, go ahead. Like you were, like you were alluding to before about the possibility that these things are maligned because perhaps they represent a threat to the powers that be the power structures that want to hoard the secrets, you know, the keys to wisdom, the keys to truth. I mean, of course, hierarchical paths of truth want to they want to hold it at the top they want to disseminate it at their will and and at their price and so i yeah i do believe that there's a certain amount of this that you know the occult or let's even go back to the gnostic path you know the gnostics were a threat they they're hated and still hated or misunderstood at the very least because you know they represented a path that said hey you don't need all these intermediaries. You don't need hierarchy. You, you as a free human being, born of spark of the divine, should have access to this, if you want it, through yourself, within yourself, cultivated from within, individually, or in a community of your choosing, but, but not through this hierarchical caste system, this priest class. That's a very, very dangerous thing for not the practitioner, <laughs> It's dangerous for the ones that who hold the power. And, you know, like you said about other things about whether it's political or within the health industry or something that threatens the pharmaceutical giants, anything that's going to come out and says, hey, guys, no, either it's free or you can access it yourself or anything that really lends, lends itself to self-empowerment or being able to cut out all these bloated fuckers in the middle. It, it, you know, their existence demands that you buy into their path anything that's going to oppose that is going to be hostile on their terms. So they're going to return that with their own brand of hostility. They're going to demonize that. They're going to fearmonger the public into thinking, yes, this is going to, this is going to open the gateways to hell. If you practice this ritual, you know, yeah, because that's the best tool that they have. That's the best weapon that they have to work with is, is fear. Yeah. You know, and, and I think historically that's what you see play out. I think you still see that going on to the very, this very day, the dangers of the cult. And, the, you know, you, you could you have a whole podcast on the nature of whether Satan exists, who Satan was, who Lucifer is, the underworld and hell, and you know, stuff that would take hours to break down. But, um, you know, these are things that have uh, been with us for a very long time and are going to always can probably continue to be an impediment to being more open about being an occult practitioner because you, you still have these stigmas going on. So why are, why are people still secret on, on one part of it is the misunderstanding. I mean, why would you want to put your career in jeopardy or your livelihood or your well being or just open yourself up to harassment from ignorant people when you can just keep, keep that information to yourself and, and be free of the headache because you can't explain to people who've already got their minds made up. You can rationally explain what your purpose is in the occult and why magic is not, is not a dangerous, evil thing. And it, it's just not going to make any difference. So having to have those conversations with closed-minded people is just a big headache. So, I mean, that's why I don't, necess I don't need to broadcast it out to the world because 
who has time to have all those debates with people? Well, I have plenty of time to do that, actually, but uh, <laughs> that's a whole I mean, other story. We all have to do it to a certain extent, but um, right. you know, you can see how it's become all fairly consuming. Well, you actually dabble in ritual magic. This is something that I have an interest in. I've never done it. I did create this sigil, this logo for this podcast. I don't think that qualifies as ritual magic, but it is a, a sigil with magical intention. Regardless, I want to know how you prepared yourself to begin this practice because I don't think I'm personally ready for it. I don't feel ready for it. So could you take me through that process? Give me some advice on what I can do to prepare myself to begin a practice like ritual magic? Yeah, sure. Um, You know, for me, it's been a long sort of preparatory development an evolution that started, you know, probably about over 12 years ago in my early 20s when uh, I was desperately looking for some solutions to a life of mine that had spiraled completely out of control and become completely intolerable due to uh, a drug and alcohol addiction. It was just kicking my ass. And um, I was really a lot of options. And I had tried you know, I've tried therapy and medicine and all all the other sort of immediate practical ways that I could think of to to free myself of uh, what I was suffering from. And, you know, that eventually the last thing I looked into was uh, a spiritual answer, <laughs> you know, because that's how desperate I was. Not, you know, I didn't get into all this stuff because uh, I um, had a deep yearning to know God or to be a good wise, learned person. Um, I got into this stuff because I was completely desperate and completely uh, out of sorts with the universe and spiraling out of control. And, and I was in a free fall because of how disconnected I was internally with, with whatever, cosmic energy, the balance of nature. So I, I, uh, I turned to practices that I thought might help me you know, and traditionally what you see um, is that uh, either organized religion or other paths of spirituality tend to have a pretty decent success rate for people. So I, I pursued that. Uh, I got involved in prayer and I got involved in meditation. I got involved in opening myself up to reading spiritual texts. I got involved in practicing martial arts and, and through that path, a deeper, more really directed instruction on meditation was allowed to happen for me and that really got me into meditation i think so that was really the first pillar of like the occult path for me was the meditation piece and i you know i just spent years and years uh working on that by itself really and um trying different different schools and different processes of of meditation and you know these they're basic tools but when i when i eventually I wanted to heighten the experience that I was having. I wanted to I wanted to have something with a little more flavor. I wanted to have something that had a little more meat to it, a little bit more, you know, because I, I am philosophically inclined. I really like, I like reading and I like cerebral stuff. So I, I just wanted to do a little more. And, and some people would say, oh, that's, you know, it's not about the mind. It's not about developing the mind. And, you know, you don't need to add all this information. But for me, whether it was curiosity or, or I wanted a deeper sense of inspiration behind uh, what I was doing or why I was doing it. You know, that's really what sort of took me to, okay, what else, what else is there? Um, I tried looking at the regular paths of organized religion and Christianity primarily because I mean, Judaism and Islam just culturally didn't feel, didn't feel right to, to, to take a look at it all. So you know, I, I looked at the Christianity thing, but, you know, basically my disposition really made it difficult for, for me seeing how that was going to really go anywhere too far. And so uh, I just started going from one book to the other. And uh, there's just, there's not a lot of books when you go to the bookstore, really, you know. Uh, there's like, there's a lot of stuff on Wicca and, you know, a lot of kind of new age stuff. And I sort of went through that and... um you know, I wasn't completely satisfied with any of that either. And it really wasn't until uh, I started listening to a lot of podcasts happen, happening to be 
focused on paranormal and extraterrestrial stuff and conspiracy, that this this idea that we talked about at the beginning of the, of the talk about a, the occult and what is the occult, you know, the occult started coming back up to me a lot in a way that uh, was, you know, I, I couldn't get around it. I couldn't ignore it. And when I started to hear it again, I got really fascinated by it. What is it? Because I had the same questions. Is it dark? Is it evil? Is it satanic? What is it? You know? And, you know, my uh, preconceived biases that, that were planted on me were disproven pretty early on listening to, uh, you know, certain podcasts that are, that are run, directed by occultists, you know, talking to other occultists, you know, and I, everything I heard was like what I'd been wanting to hear my whole life, basically. It was like, finally. It all just hit me so directly and it resonated so strongly about how these people describe their path and what inspired them or what motivated them or what results that they were getting that uh, it, that's really when it crystallized and it all came together through listening to other people's firsthand testimony about the occult. And from then, it, then I mean, that was really the preparation that I needed to feel comfortable about it was, you know, one, having the years of meditation grounding me and a lot of research and study and other paths and then having other people present it to me in a way that was was uh incredibly appealing and incredibly intellectually stimulating as well as as creatively and and spiritually so th that's really how it all came together for me um the preparation i think another thing i would say about that is one of the things when you talk about danger or potential negative side effects that might come about through the occult practice, I think the only the thing that you come across as far as warnings or things to, to consider is, you know, where am I psychologically coming into this? How healthy is my mind? And how comfortable am I with who I really am? How, have I really looked at myself and, and done deep introspection work? to start to kind of understand what my dark side is and what my shadow side is. What are the things that motivate me unconsciously? I, I actually had spent years, not formally with a therapist, but independently and with other, other people who are working on a spiritual path, you know, doing a lot of unpackaging of myself. And that went on for years and, and, and frankly still goes on. But the unpacking myself psychologically, emotionally and mentally, and dealing with a lot of the, the traumas and the harms that had gone on in my life through childhood and early adulthood that kind of had set me off on a wrong path, I think it was a very, very important preparationally to have spent a lot of time in introspection, in self-analysis, in growing in self-awareness, and in doing a lot of prayer invocation to have these things removed or to, to be moved to a different place of understanding or, or processing and in dealing with day-to-day -day interactions and motivations and drives and things. So a lot of it's you know, kind of Jungian in a sense. I think, I think a good place for some people to start might be Carl Jung, you know, as a, as a foundation for coming to know yourself better from, a, from an unconscious perspective, from a drives perspective. And having done a lot of that, I felt fairly comfortable with myself to start to be okay to opening myself up to higher realms or higher dimensions to start to ask for those things to be open up to me um i felt and still because i'm fairly new at all this stuff my feeling is one where i do feel you know ready to have to call down upon these forces and to to try to to work with what's out there to really go to the next to the next level but you know this, we're talking about like 11 or 12 years of just basic meditation basic prayer ritual and self-analysis and psychological introspection so <laughs> it's a long road to get to somebody who just wants to get out and bust out some rituals <laughs> you know 10 12 years of meditation might be a bridge too far and i'm not saying that that's what anyone else needs I'm not saying that's required at all, I think, but I do think a good period of, of commitment to that kind of basic level of uh, opening yourself up. Yeah, and I think that that's what scares people the most is that, you know, as opposed to religion, which externalizes everything, the occult philosophy and practice forces you to internalize, to yes. really 
look at yourself like like you've been talking about and study yourself and really get to know yourself for the first time because once I started reading a lot about this stuff and really studying it, taking it seriously on some level, I realized that I was not who I thought I was. And I'm not <laughs> yeah. I'm not an intense practitioner. I don't practice anything. I mean, I meditate, I do yoga, which I think is preparing me to maybe take the next step like you've been talking about. You meditated for years and then you took that next step and I'm getting there, you know, to that next step. But once I started reading a lot more about this stuff and meditating more and doing more yoga and eating better even, I think just trying to treat myself better, I realized that a lot of the things that I've been doing in my life weren't really for me. They were for other people or they were because I felt like that's what this society demanded of me is that I have to, to do this. I have to graduate high school, go to college, find a mate, marry them, get a job, buy a house. And I realized none of that shit really even matters. That's all material, superficial bullshit that, <laughs> that doesn't fit who I am internally. And that's yeah. what's scary to most people is that when you really turn to face yourself for the first time, you're kind of scared by yeah. what you see. But once you No, wait... I mean, this is not a path. Say what? Go ahead, sir. No, I was going to say, but but once you wade through that darkness, you come out on the other side a better person. You know, once you face that shadow self, which I think is a phrase that you threw out earlier, once you face your shadow self, man, you've, you've really conquered or at least began the process of, of conquering this external reality that, it just forces you to be somebody that you're really not. I totally agree with that. This is not a path for people who are complacent or want to be comfortable. If you want to be sort of in a, a very comfortable place uh, where you don't have a lot of questions or you don't have a lot of um, disturbance about yourself, the world around you, you definitely don't want to be a part of the occult. Um, the occult is, is specifically for people who sort of already intuitively know that the world is fucked. In a, in a certain way, not at its core level, but at the level at which the individuals in, who run this world or who have the have the power controls, they've certainly created a, um, a situation where it's in their favor that everybody under them, in, in subservience to them, doesn't know who they are, who is completely delusional about themselves and will sort of eat out of their palm for whatever sort of complacency will be will be doled out to them it's the easiest to digest for people who instinctively understand this is not right the way that this world is structured is not right the way that things are organized is not right the people who are running this shouldn't be involved here and there's just that dis-ease that discomfort with things not being right and um once you have that it's sort of like a virus you know and it just grows and, and for me i'm certainly in a, in a lot of days very disturbed about the nature of reality, the nature of, you know, what what has to be done to make a living or the, the nature of how our relationships are constructed and how we can't be completely open with each other because there's so much fear. But but once you have that notion within you, seated within you, there's no there's no turning back. So once you're in the thick of it, there you have to power through, in my mind. Like I'm probably, you know, I'm in the thick of the darkness of working my way to a place of clarity. But it's like, I know that there, the road back doesn't exist anymore. There is no road back to blissful ignorance. You know? yeah. So yeah. I, either, I either have to continue towards the path of, of illumination or light or truth, or I can stick, be stuck in the middle of it, which pretty much sucks. Um, and, and, you know, for me, yeah, the, the path of the occult and, and ceremonial magic, ritual work, you know, these paths, they do offer a way out of this material, materialistic hell, <laughs> you know, the monotonous day in, day out grind. And I think, you know, for a lot of people who are disturbed politically or disturbed socially about the way the world is, I think, you know, yeah, you know, there's, there's activism and there's things you can do to work towards making the world a better place. But I think the occult is really a beautiful place for, for political malcontents to, to find themselves so that, you know, because it's all about gearing yourselves towards truth and, and what's real and 
kind of getting into an existential battle with, with the Maya and the disillusion, the falseness, the, the unreality that we're being forced to accept. Whether it, it, usually it'll either manifest because you're politically discontent or you came up in a religion that made you religiously discontent or you just, you know, socially or through the process of work, you know, or being disconnected from nature. Any one of these things could be sort of the gateway or the trigger point that forces you to go within and realize there, there is no externalized solution to what we're dealing with. If, I, if we could just go out and buy a pill or, or, you know, that next pair of jeans that would make this all go away, <laughs> I'm sure we would have all done that. But Wait a minute, Jeff. Are you saying you know, that re- retail therapy doesn't work? <laughs> you know, there's a lot of things that work momentarily, but... Um, the occult is that place where you come, where you want something that's that's a little more firm, that has some longevity to the benefits, that can free us from these, you know, the chains of conformity in a more lasting, substantial way, rather than you know the five minute escape. I can watch a movie and escape from the dire nature of reality for a couple of hours, but you know, have I changed on the other side of that? Not really. Um, so it's hard work, you know, and I think it's it's a rarefied field to be in because it is it's unconventional it's 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 very hard it requires daily work and effort but for those that engage in it i think you know it's a, it's about the hope and the promise of a sort of a life that's that's much greater and much more fulfilling than than just powering through and struggling through you know one escape to the next i mean I, that's the way i found it is a life that's fascinating not only intellectually and but creatively and um, imaginatively, you know, I get to have a world that's that's created. You know, I, I, I'm not necessarily changing the world as it is, but I'm changing my own in, interior landscape on a day-to-day basis uh, by engaging with this path. And I think I think sovereignty of the self is one of the major things that it motivates me because I realize that I'm up against a behemoth of a monster, socially, politically, spiritually, all these forces out there are are tremendously hostile and very difficult to work with or or to subvert in a way where you can gain some sovereignty back over your thoughts and over your feelings, over your emotions, over your sense of agency and direction. And I can't really think of any better path for me, the way that I'm wired, than the occult to really pull back some of the reins, to get into my own mind and assess myself in a way that I can start to abandon and unleash a lot of this garbage, a lot of these things that have been placed here from external sources, these things that are not of me, that they're not true to who I am or what I, what I believe, but they've just been placed there. So, you know, subliminally or through peer pressure or social pressure groups or political pressure groups, there's just so much that we deal with in our minds that is um, not of us. And I feel like the occult has tools for self-empowerment, you know, to re- regain some sovereignty over, over our minds and what we think. And, and reprogramming our mind, I think, is one of, those, one of those catchphrases within the occult that really, like Robert Anton Wilson, I think, wrote about this a lot, you know, um, where what this is really all about is unprogramming, deprogramming, and then reprogramming in a way that's more deliberate and intentional. Yeah, man, I would absolutely agree with that. You mentioned, though, escaping, and you were talking about film earlier. We talked about film to start the conversation. Let's wrap up on a positive note here and revisit horror films. You're a big horror geek. I like horror films as well. I'm not as big of a geek as you are. You know a lot more about that stuff than I do. But let's build a list here of your top five horror films. And you can go as obscure as you want, and I'm, I'm putting you on the spot, I understand that, but I'm just really interested in, I think those sorts of, of anecdotes about people really show who they are and what their personality is, and you're an artist as well, so let's start this list here. Let's go, in no particular order, top five horror films. Yeah, there's very few topics that I like to talk about more than uh, horror it is hard, however, to uh, to start to rank stuff. I always really have a hard time with ranking, whether it's bands or records or 
movies. Um, I, I love to organize and I love to make lists and I love to compile, but then I always sort of really get stuck on, uh, and, and I'm just the type of obsessive person that will spend an hour like, is this third or is this fourth, you know, or, or <laughs> yeah. you know, that type of thing can get me tied up for, for hours on end. But I can definitely, without necessarily putting a one, two, three, four, five rank, I, I would throw out five of uh, particularly meaningful films that I like. Let's see, I'm scared and, you know, I'd love to be obscure because I do, I've watched so many hours of B films and just really underground horror and a lot of it's shit, you know, <laughs> but, but I, because <laughs> yeah. it's really, in, sometimes the shittier it is, the more enjoyable it is. And, um, you know, I've even had some fun on my blog writing kind of just really silly reviews of uh, old VHS films. I, I'm actually though, I'm very sympathetic and I'm very forgiving when it comes to horror films. I, I don't know what it is, but I think part of it is like it was there for me when I was a kid and when I was a weird loner kid and an only child spending a lot of time alone, uh, feeling misunderstood and, you know, having a chip on my shoulder against the world, like horror films were there, you know, and they were like, they were like a friend to me, you know, in a sad way. <laughs> so there's a, there's like an emotional sort of irrationality about <laughs> how I perceive films. And I get that way about, like I get really possessive about directors and stuff. Like I really give people the benefit of the doubt. You know what I mean? If somebody's made some great films, like I will defend the movies that no one else will defend. You know, or I'll, I'll try to see, <laughs> see the beauty of something that they, even if they were just attempting and they failed, you know, it's like, I mean, those are the types of ends that I will go to analyzing these films. Anyways, you know, so some of my favorites, I think I'm going to throw out lately something that's risen on my list over where it was probably when I first saw it is uh, Scanners by David Cronenberg. Just come to really, really love this film. Just super impressed by Cronenberg's intellect and his, you know, the ideas that uh, the fascinating cerebral and weird stuff that he was dealing with in horror sci-fi films. It was really blew, blown me away, and, uh, you know, Scanners is just, there's just a feel about that movie that's really, really fascinating and visually stunning, and I really love just, you know, the idea about it, you know, everything about the uh, psychic abilities, always, anytime there's, there's, there's not really a lot of great psychic films, or, you know, you have telekinetic power, I think Scanners probably is one of the better ones in that genre. And I would probably go for, for just pure creativity and just kind of, I don't know, just totally insane level of, of artistic, creative inspiration. I would go to Clyde Barker's Hellraiser number one, uh, which that's pretty much been, it's always been one of my favorites since I was a kid. But, uh, you know, it, it's really, to me, it's stood the test of time. I think it's 30 years old now. Um, but I still think the characters that he created, like, are still completely mind blowing. And, um, you know, the darkness and, uh, just the idea. Again, we were talking a lot about mysterious stuff and, you know, the box and what that represents and the gateway to hell and everything. I think it's just handled in a really fantastic way in that movie. On a lighter note and a more comedic horror film, I really love Reanimator, which we touched on earlier too, I think, from the old H.P. Lovecraft story. I'm always really impressed by uh, prosthetic special effects, and I've really got a, a place in my heart for um, the special effects artists that uh, create create monsters and create gore effects. And I think Reanimator just totally totally mind blowing the creatures that they create in that film um, and the shocking sort of gore and and the, and the fact that they did it in a very tongue in cheek, really funny way too, really dark subversions. So I thought Reanimator is really great. Let's see. Two more. I always want to throw in a Toby Hooper film because he's probably one of the, you know, representative of the top four geniuses in horror, Wes Craven, John Carpenter, George Romero, and Toby Hooper. But of the four, I think Toby Hooper is like, he's like always cast aside and people just talk so much shit about him on the internet. And he's not 
really given a lot of mercy for his for the way his career's turned out and uh I just feel, feel like he's definitely a genius in the horror genre and uh I think he deserves more credit than than uh than he gets and certainly everybody gives him unanimous praise for Texas Chainsaw Massacre and and uh I think that's probably his, his best film as well but I I want to throw in a movie he made in 1985 called Life Force and again, over time, this one has really grown on me. I, I mean, I loved it as a kid as well, but I've recently got a new DVD Blu-ray combo pack from Scream Factory, which I don't know if you're, if you're a horror geek, you probably know who Scream Factory is, but they, they've been doing an awesome job re-releasing uh, a lot of classic horrors and like remastering it and putting in all these bonus features and extras and interviews and production art. Sometimes you know, releasing director's cuts of everything. So this latest one they put out of Life Force, which uh, Toby had originally wanted to call Space Vampires. The studio wanted it to be Life Force because that sounded like more intellectual. It sounded less campy, you know, than Space Vampires. But um, I think the, the wackiness and the insane amount of just wild... I mean, he was throwing everything everything into this film everything in the kitchen sink went into life force zombies vampires aliens i mean you name it and uh life force it just has all this stuff going on in it and uh i think it's definitely worth a rewatch if people haven't seen it in a while and definitely the scream factory one certainly gave me uh, a whole new level of appreciation for that flick and the last film i i really you know again uh i should i'm totally remiss to not throw in like wes craven or george romero which easily could have flicks in there. And George, John Carpenter, I feel like really belongs in there. So, but I'm also wanting to sort of give a, an obscure film, which you've asked for. So because of my inability to, to hold true to these kind of lists, I'm going to go with a tie on the last one. I want to, cause I want to say the thing by John Carpenter, 1982, but I also really want to say Suspiria by Dario Argento. I just couldn't be, and I, and I could continue to add addendums onto this, but um, I would feel very comfortable if I could end on those two. Because I guess, you know, Argento and Carpenter are just, you know, they're just masters in this genre. And I think from a creative art direction stance, from a special effects stance, from a musical score stance, I think, you know, like The Thing and Suspiria are just incredible. And I can watch these movies and probably will watch them until I'm dead. I mean, just over and over and over and over again, and you know, still, <laughs> still dig it. So I could keep going and going and going, but those, I think, feel like for right now, that's a good list. I'm glad you mentioned Suspiria because that's probably my number one. Like, if I actually made a list of from one to five or ten or whatever, that probably pop up at number one just because of the atmosphere. It's very. Uh, nightmarish, but also subtle at the same time. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Very I mean, surreal. atmosphere, that's really the word. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, in, in horror, you can get in, you can, people really get lost in campiness or they can get lost in just setting up scares, you know, setting up the jolt, you know, the jump scare moment and, and lose the whole ambiance of atmosphere. I mean, and really, yeah, I mean, the best horror is just where you have an atmosphere that stays with the film from the very beginning to the end. And it's, it's not just structured around a bunch of different jump scares. It's, it's like this mood, you know, a mood of menace and dis discomfort that uh, can sustain through the entire piece. And I think and a lot of it has to do with the score. I mean, Argento had some of the best scores in his films and Suspiria is like, that's a soundtrack I will listen to on any given day. Just like, on its own, you know what I mean? Which is kind of odd. I also like, um, and just to throw this out there, because I want people to go back and watch it, but I'm a huge fan of Nosferatu, you know, the uh, 1922, uh -huh. I think, the 21 or 22 German film. God, yeah. that thing terrified me. I don't, I don't I don't remember when the first time I watched it was as far as age, but I was fairly young. I was probably 19 or 20. That's probably in college. But even then, man, it, it was just, it creeped me out. And... Count Orlock is just, God, talk about an iconic character that definitely give you nightmares if you just look at it. You know, if, if you just Googled that, that name right now and you saw a picture of him, you'd you dream about that guy tonight. 
Yeah, I think there's yeah there's there's a lot to be said for the presence of of a face or a costume or just the the figure that that's cut by a certain shape <laughs> by a villain in a horror film and you know Nosferatu certainly pretty much got the whole thing going. For sure, man. Was that a silent film, right? Yeah, silent film. It's crazy so, I mean, how it just shows you what what you can do with yeah, yeah very very little, you know. Well, that just goes to show you that not just in art, but in life, less is more. Yeah, it's, it's often true. I think that's the whole premise of this conversation. You know, we're talking about occult philosophy and filmmaking. And I think what everything ties back to is, is that general premise that less is more. So I think that's a good note to wrap up on, Jeff. Tell people where they can keep up with you and your work. Okay, you can uh, pretty much get everything at the Secret Transmissions blog, secrettransmissions.com. Uh, I also have... Uh, a Facebook page set up for that. Um, I would love for people to to like and participate and comment there. I'd love to see more like feedback that way because the blog itself, you know, it just sort of exists there, and you know, you don't necessarily know what people have thought or if they've read it at all or anything. So I have the Facebook page to sort of maybe help try to stimulate feedback or conversation. Um, I'm also very active on Twitter. To either could search it for by just Secret Transmissions or my underscores uh, Secret Wolf. T- 23 so any of those places would be would be great to meet new people and uh i appreciate anybody who you know reaches out or gives the blog a look over absolutely it's well worth a read i don't know about you but i'm gonna go pop in my dvd copy of suspiria right now you've really put me in the mood for it so jeff wolf thanks for being here man i really appreciate your time thank you very much talk to you later all right, there you have it. My thanks again to Jeff Wolf, secrettransmissions.com, linked in the show notes. Give the dude some clicks. He has some great stuff on there. Some of the posts we mentioned are linked in the show notes as well, as are links to all the horror films we mentioned. For what it's worth, I totally watched Suspiria as soon as we were done talking. And for what this is worth, here's my top five horror films. Sans Suspiria and Sans Nosferatu, which I also mentioned to Jeff. A couple classics up front here, John Carpenter's Halloween and George Romero's Night of the Living Dead. I do think The Thing, which Jeff mentioned, is the superior Carpenter flick, but there's something about that original Halloween film that I just adore. The atmosphere, the score, and come on, the scream queen herself, Jamie Lee Curtis. Mm, mm, mm. And Night of the Living Dead, I mean, there's really no explanation needed for that. It's got everything you want in a horror movie. Low budget, black and white, poignant social commentary. It's funny for a few minutes. And then, you know, the cannibalism and incest and necrophilia kick in. But yeah, everything you want. I guess this one's a classic too. Evil Dead 2, Dead by Dawn. The original Evil Dead is up there for me too, but the sequel just cranks that volume up to 11 with the gory special effects and the scares and just the sheer inventiveness of it. And no horrorist is really complete without Bruce Campbell's chin. How about this one? The Vanishing, a Dutch film from 1988, which I wish I would have asked Jeff about during our conversation because I've never actually talked to anyone who's seen it. But there's a gorgeous version of it in the Criterion Collection, which is well worth a purchase. And last but not least... Let the right one in from 2008, because everybody needs a little vampirism in their life. An honorable mention to Stanley Kubrick's The Shining, because all work and no play makes Ryan a dull boy. In fact, I'm done working. It's playtime. You've been listening to Old Culture. I am Ryan Peverly, reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. Oh,